Well, I am a little undone right now. Thank you, worship team. Um, that was beautiful. I was reminded during service of a time in my life when worship was very difficult and um, just left me a little undone. So if you're in that place today, you are not alone. We're going to take a look at one of Jesus's healing in scripture today in Luke chapter 7. And um, I love like the fact that of his healings, they're all different and they're all nuanced. And today's healing is no different for being different. Um, But let's just talk about a few of his healings. There was a healing where Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law, and how he did it was he took her by the hand and declared a healing. He reached out once to a leper to heal him. I'm going to put my glasses on, wherever they are. Glad I found them. He commanded a paralytic to stand up. Didn't touch him, just commanded him, stand up, take your mat and walk, be healed. He told another man who had a withered hand, just stretch out your hand and you'll be healed. Once a woman just reached out to him with her hand and he, she was healed. Instantly, scripture said in that case. Once he made a paste out of dirt, we talked about this healing about a year ago, put it on a man's eyes and he was healed. Prior, just this, we're looking today at Luke 7, 11 to 17, but in Luke 7, 1 to 10, there was um, a, uh, someone's servant that was healed, and Jesus was miles away. He just simply declared the healing. Why healings? A lot of people have a lot of opinions on this, but I tend to appreciate the Gospel of John's writer, writer John himself, what he says on why. Why healings? John writes that we may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing in him that we would have life in his name. Scripture tells us why there's healings, but that's, that is an accurate, true statement about why there's healings. But as we'll see in the healing today, there's a motive in the healings account that I think is comforting and can change our lives if we really got it. And it's this, is that God, the God of history, the God of all time, the creator God, the one who's in our midst, he is moved by compassion for those that, who are in need. God is moved by compassion. He has compassion. We're going to talk about what that means today for those who are in need. So if you're in need today, you are in a good place for the next 20 minutes. Let's pray before we read the passage. Father, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to know you. I'm grateful for your word. I'm grateful for the privilege of studying your word and all that is in it. And these little times in studying where we peel a curtain and all of a sudden there's just the truth comes to life. I pray that for this passage for those here today. I pray that your spirit would reveal the truths of this healing that can change us, that literally could change our lives. So I thank you for this passage. I thank you more importantly that you are a healer and what that can mean for us and does mean, has meant, and will mean in the future. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. So Luke 7, 11 to 17. Soon afterward, after that prior healing of the centurion's son, soon after that, Jesus went to a town called Nain and his disciple, with his disciples, and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. The word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. So a little, just a little bit of background. Modern day Israel, historic Israel as well. Um, Nain is just a little bit up on a hill overlooking a town. It's almost like a bench on a hill. That's where the town is. 
So once Jesus had chosen his disciples and began to travel, scripture says here, but we know from history that large crowds traveled with him. So you picture this large crowd headed to a city gate. City gate is kind of like the city center. Picture Towson Town Center as the city center of Towson, where a lot of activity, a lot of people. If you did a traffic study, most people would be coming and going at the city gate all day long. So you've got Jesus and his disciples, a large crowd, but he also says that this group carrying this, young, this man that had died, the widow's only son, that there was a large crowd with her. And we also know from history that, um, and continues to this day, and we could learn a lot from our Jewish brothers and sisters, that there was a whole lot of people there to pay tribute and honor to this woman who lost her son. So you have a whole large crowd of mourners, you have a large crowd, and they meet at this city gate. So all that to say is there's a lot of people there. And this, this passage, does, there's a lot of interesting things about this healing. One of the most interesting things is nobody asked for healing in this one. It's certainly not the only time Jesus healed that nobody asked, but there aren't that many. Nobody in the passage said, heal my son. Nobody. The only words spoken in the passage are, there's three occasions of dialogue, and they're, they're short. Jesus to the, the mother, don't weep. Jesus to the dead son. Talk about that for a minute, um, in a minute. And then the crowd's response to the healing. Not much dialogue, but there's a lot for the senses. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about just three simple things. We're going to talk about a gaze, a touch, and a joyful response. A gaze, a touch, and a joyful response. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her. I want you to just for a minute think about the power of a mother's gaze. I thought about this. The power of a gaze, for me, the power of a mother's gaze was the most powerful, whether it's my mother or myself as a mother or other mothers I know. I thought, in a moment, my gaze can do a lot to children, especially when they were little. Actually, I think it's still true today. Um, but there was a time that, um, think about a time, like I think the most powerful gaze that I could give my kids was when, was when I was on the phone. And it would go something like this. Hello, you know, you're chatting away and your kids start talking in the background. Like, stop talking. Hey, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, really good. No, stop. <laughs> and with your gaze, the power to quiet a three-year-old. One time I was on the phone, and hey, Quinn, can you hand me that little bag that's on the floor in front of you? One time I was on the phone, and uh, I did that, did that thing that, like, angry, but I'm really serious, the little one. I'm, like, super serious right now. And it was, uh, my brother was in the hospital. It was a big thing in my family, so I was probably on the phone a long time. Back in the day when the phone was actually attached to the wall, but we had an extra long cord, but I couldn't reach my kids. It's important. I was cooking their dinner. They were getting hungry. I did the angry face. They were quiet. They actually looked scared. They were six, four, and three, and I was pregnant with Quinn, and they looked kind of scared of me. And I felt bad, but I was also on the phone, and so what any wannabe Italian mother um, would do is I thought food. So I just started throwing marshmallows at them. <laughs> just, just started whipping marshmallows. I think I went through a whole bag of marshmallows on the phone. And I wasn't a big sugar mom, and so that was like a huge treat. Um, but that was the power of my gaze. I scared my kids. But there's other gazes of mothers. There's the gaze of a mom when you're caught, you're busted, and yet she still looks at you with tender, loving eyes. There's the gaze of a mom when you know you've done something, and she doesn't know, and you can hardly look at her. And then there's the gaze of my own mom. I would say what I miss the most about my mom is when I would walk in her home in North Carolina, I'd smell the pine trees coming in. I'd walk in and I knew I was home because she'd be in the kitchen cooking multiple of my favorite dishes. And she'd look up and I knew I was home. And she was happy and I was happy. The gaze of a mom is a powerful thing. So let's think about a moment back to the gaze in scripture. All it says is Jesus looked at her, but it tells us more, actually. It says he looked at her with compassion. And he didn't just look at her with compassion, like, oh, it wasn't sympathy, people. It wasn't, I'm sorry. I love this um, response from Francois Bauvin. 
I just like, I like his name, offering a commentary on this set. He says, the whole story begins with this gaze in this healing. It starts with a look from Jesus to a heartbroken widow. He sees her distress and he has compassion. The Greek word for compassion here, splagnizomai, is even more than empathy. It literally means a clenching of your gut. It's that, it's that compassion that when you see something, it, maybe it happens to you in a film, maybe it has happened in real life recently, when you go, oh. He looks at her and he's like, oh. I think he's a lot of other things too, but he's empathetic for sure. We're gonna watch um, a two minute video on empathy because it says it better than I ever could and then we're gonna talk about some things that maybe were in Jesus' gaze. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions, where empathy is relevant, and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So Renee Brown, the author of that, the voice in that little video clip, she, she basically studies what is the human response to painful situations. So she studies shame and vulnerability and connection, and in this case, empathy. I love those four things that she says empathy is. Perspective, taking the ability to recognize another's perspective and take it. Staying out of judgment recognizing emotion in other people and communicating to that emotion. If we look at this passage, we see all four of those things so strongly. We see Jesus seeing the woman whose even her plight is emphasized by the scripture. Her plight of the, the widow whose only son had died. We see that he understands that she's in a societally awful position, left with no one to take care of her. We see that he is moved by that, and in a sense takes that on. We'll get, we're gonna talk about staying out of judgment in a second. We clearly see that he recognized her emotion and stepped in. I wonder what 
we, each of us in this room, need to see on the face of Jesus today. I wonder really what she saw on his face. Talked about this with some folks at dinner on Friday night at our house, and everybody's response was so interesting. But it made me realize how we respond to that question is what we need to see. What we think Jesus saw, what what we think the woman saw in Jesus' face is most likely what we need to see at this moment in his face. One person at the table said, I think he was angry. And I at first was a little bit, and then I thought that's brilliant. What mother who lost their only child wouldn't want the God of the universe to be angry? It's not meant to be this way. Death was never a part of the picture. A mother should never bury a child. Maybe that's what he saw. Maybe that's what she saw in his face. I believe it is. Clearly there was love. Clearly there was compassion. Clearly there was, I understand But it doesn't end there. And I think a lot of us, I do, and I think more and more this is happening with the gospel, with scripture. People are teaching this part of who God is, and it's it's accurate to a point. It's the true God. He loves us. He looks at us this way. He is close to the brokenhearted, 100%. But this passage and the rest of scripture doesn't end there. Interesting. So that's the gaze. What's the touch? He reaches out and touches the beer. Okay, so, a little history lesson. They have to bury the dead bodies outside of town because of the stench. They don't have the same understanding of burial as we do today. So they're carrying the sun on on wooden planks. Very ceremonial, a lot of laws in the Old Testament how to do this. Carrying, and the sun's body is most likely not even in a casket, really. It's like an open container. Jesus steps in and touches the wooden plank. I mean... We could all read that and never even think about it. Okay, he touched the plank. But if we understood Levitical law, in that moment, he did something that was ceremonially so wrong, so unclean. Think about how there's like funeral etiquette. It'd be like wearing a pink party dress to a funeral. It's just he broke the rules. But here he broke some pretty sacred rules. And he became unclean in that moment. So let's go back to Brene Brown, and she says that the most empathetic people are those who don't judge. I mean, I think that sounds really good. Have you ever tried to not judge somebody who you kind of do judge? Think about it. It's hard. It's actually impossible. How could Jesus be the example of somebody who doesn't judge people? I mean, if he is the ultimate of everything, and, you know, aren't we here because we somewhat believe that, how could he be the example? And that's where this passage comes to life. He can be, he is, because he took on judgment. He doesn't judge because he paid the penalty for judgment. He took on our judgment on the cross. So there's the gaze, and there's also this reminder of you need this. You need me. You need what I did for you to be whole. It's as if with a look and a touch, this passage is the entire gospel. Right here, summed up. Very little dialogue, a whole lot of truth, and a joyful response. Think about a time in your life that God has done something that you're thrilled about. You cannot not speak of it. Try. You can't not talk about it. He met me. He, he's changing my life. He's, he's helping me to parent. He's the giver of wisdom, and I need him. Back to what we said in the beginning. Healing, it's to know who Jesus is and that we would have life and faith in him. And they show us that he is close to those who need him. What a beautiful, simple, most profound passage of healing in scripture. Death unto life. He became unclean for us to become whole. He took on the consequences of judgment for sin so we don't have to bear it. 
We don't have to judge others. So in a moment when I'm tempted to judge another, what I need to remember in that moment is the touch. And I need to remember the touch for my life. He took on my sin, the things that would cause judgment for me. That's how I'm not going to be able to judge another. Otherwise, I'm dead. I'm lost. I can't not do it. Anytime I think about healing in the Gospels, I think about the fact that people, um, are, most of us, are walking around caring a lot. And most of us are walking around at any given moment and asking, why does God allow evil and suffering to continue in the world? I was in um, Colorado recently, and a friend, Mike and I were with a friend of mine, and she just disclosed something very painful to us. And she asked the question, and one of us began to answer in my marriage, and the other one shut the other one up. Like, don't you dare try to answer that question of why there's evil and suffering in the world. Because you know what? As much as the cross gives us, it doesn't give us the answer to that question. But here's what it does do, and these are not my words. What does it do? What does the cross do? We know what it isn't. We know what evil and suffering isn't. It can't be that he doesn't love us. It can't be that he's different or detached from our condition. God takes on our misery and suffering so seriously that he was willing to take it on himself. So what we do know is that he's close, and it's a compassionate and a love. I just think these are good things for us to ponder today. I think most of all, the best thing for us to ponder today is what do I need from him and his gaze today. And it might be wisdom. It might be you're making, I know for me, that's what I need today. I need wisdom for some things in my life. I'm just not sure what the right thing is. I have no idea, actually. I need wisdom. We're going to um, have a prayer time. The worship team's going to come back up, and we're just going to close with you all, anybody who wants to come up for prayer. And a little bit of a um, disclaimer with that, it doesn't have to be a big, giant thing. I'm, I'm really being honest here. If I wasn't up here praying for you all, I would be coming up asking for prayer for this thing in my life. And I wouldn't tell you what it is either. I would just say, pray for me. I need discernment. God knows. So we're just going to, and if you just want to use this time as a time of silent reflection to consider the gaze and the touch, we welcome you to do that as well. And I'll come back up and close this in a few minutes. So scripture tells us that we do not have a high priest that can't sympathize with our weakness, but one who is tempted and tried in all things as we are, but yet he never sinned, and that that's why he can come alongside us. So in taking on our judgment, he took on the feeling of lust, of power, the sin of greed, and he did all of that without sinning, but he did it so he can come to our aid. So he touched the ceremonially, the grave, the sacred site, and became unclean for us so that he can come along our side in the places of struggle, in the places of pain, with a look of compassion and a feeling of love and a sense of great love for us. Church One, may this week mark us as a community of individuals who will allow the gaze of Christ to pierce our hearts and the touch of Christ to move us to places of forgiveness and grace. I hope you have a great week of walking in those thin places. Amen.